Can aerosols spread COVID-19? Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com. My PhD is in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor, and this is not medical advice. Moving toward the topic that we will cover tomorrow, which is how dangerous is the inside air in public spaces for COVID-19, as opposed to the topic we covered yesterday, how dangerous is the outside air which we, in which we concluded nowhere near as dangerous as the inside air, if you saw that slash uh, listen to that yesterday. Uh, in preparation for covering the danger of the inside air, we're going to cover the topic of whether aerosols can spread COVID-19. And aerosols are small droplets that are small enough that they aren't weighed down to the ground by gravity quickly and can circulate in the air for quite a while. So in a preprint published on July 21st, researchers collected air samples from six COVID-19 patients. They grouped aerosols between 0.542 and 20 micrometers into three groups of less than one micrometer, one to four micrometers, and greater than four micrometers. This resulted in 18 samples, so three size groups from six patients. Three of the 18 samples were able to produce viral growth in isolated cells. These included a 1 to 4 micrometer sample from one patient, and both the less than 1 and the 1 to 4 micrometer samples from another patient. So the air around two out of the six patients had aerosols that could grow in uh, isolated cells in a lab dish. That also means that the air around the other four patients did not. And between those two patients, there were uh, three out of the six size samples. Okay, so the authors concluded that, quote, airborne transmission of COVID-19 is possible and that aerosol prevention measures are necessary to effectively stem the spread of SARS-CoV-2. But these results aren't very convincing for two reasons. Uh, but these results aren't very convincing is my statement, right? So their quote ends at, uh, at the transmission may uh, be airborne. Okay. I'm saying these results aren't very convincing. Okay. Reason number one out of two. In the two... In two of the samples, there were large and statistically significant decreases in viral copies, but in all the others, there were no changes in viral copies. So that's three samples that produced growth, two that produced large negative growth, meaning the viral copies just got decimated. They went from, you know, a little bit to none, but practically. And most of the samples, there was no viral growth. Uh, so that's overwhelmingly the the virus is just deteriorating or not doing anything. And the small minority of cases, is it growing at all? The second thing is the growth that they measured was measured over five to six days. The maximum growth that took place in total across those five to six days was a fourfold increase in viral copies. This is in stark contrast to what is probably the normal live growth rate of SARS-CoV-2, which I previously described in my response to Rhonda Patrick about vitamin D as something along the order of 60,000 to 70,000% growth every 7 to 36 hours over the course of 8 to 16 days in a live human infection. So compare 60 to 70,000 percent every 7 to 36 hours. And in this lab dish, they gave it 5 to 6 days. So we didn't see the results of 8 to 16 days. But the fold increase over that time period with very uh, robust viral reproduction capability i'd have to plug it into a uh into an you know an appreciation calculator but it would be astronomical compared to uh four to five fold growth over five to six days so even in the three samples that grew 
the growth looks unimpressive to say the least and honestly impotent and pathetic. So it does appear that small aerosols can contain infectious virus or at least virus capable of reproducing. But I would hesitate to even say that we could conclude that the virus is infectious because the mere fact that it can reproduce at all does not mean that it can reproduce fast enough to overcome the human immune system. There's a reason that there's a threshold required called the infectious dose, and it's because the virus has to be present in enough quantity to reproduce and to reproduce fast enough to produce an amount of virus beyond what the immune system can initially handle before it has been ramped up in response. Okay, so this would seem to conflict with a paper published in April in the New England Journal of Medicine that found good stability of SARS-CoV-2 in aerosols experimentally created with a nebulizer over the course of three hours. However, there are some big differences between these two studies. First of all, the concentration of virus in the New England Journal of Medicine paper was at least double what was found isolated from patients in this latest paper, and it was 10 to 20 times the concentration in many of the samples from the new paper. More to the point, the New England Journal of Medicine paper was looking at the survival of the RNA in the aerosol, while the latest paper we're discussing now is looking at their ability to grow in human cells. So the April paper in New England Journal of Medicine did not show that the virus was capable of reproducing in human cells. It just showed that the RNA didn't get degraded. So it's very possible that the RNA is not degraded over the course of a few hours, and yet something about the ability of the virus to replicate is degraded, which is not that, uh, which is you know n not that implausible at all. Uh, without knowing the exact mechanisms, the integrity of the virus and its ability to reproduce requires many things beyond just the RNA being there. It has to have a certain formation that is unable to infect cells and replicate. So if the viability of the virus is rather poor in aerosols compared to large droplets, this seems to suggest that when we're talking about social distancing and mask wearing and so on, we're primarily looking at the spread of of droplets from coughing and sneezing and talking. And we're looking at the large droplets rather than the aerosol. So we probably do not need to be worrying about whether the air from someone from a while ago may have released aerosols that are hanging out for hours in the air. We probably much more need to worry about whether those large droplets that were re released very recently are coming into contact with us before they hit the ground. Now, the study, on the other hand, supports that aerosols can harbor virus that is capable of growing. And so we need to be careful about exactly how much confidence we give to one or the other position. One thing that I would note is I don't know off the top of my head why it would be that the virus might lose its replicating ability in aerosols and not in large droplets. And certainly, given my area of expertise, uh, you know, had I were I in a discussion with a physicist or a virologist, this might be more productive. But my initial thought is that it has something to do with the damaging effects of ultraviolet light. So I, I suspect that there are strong antimicrobial effects of ultraviolet light and moderate or maybe at least weak antimicrobial effects of blue light and that the access of the light to the virus is greater in smaller particles because of the effect of the water in the droplet diffracting light. And if that's the case, I think one thing that we have to be very careful about is that presumably the effect of that light or the effect of whatever it is that is eroding the replication abilities of the virus in the aerosols takes some time. 
And we don't know how long that time frame is. So perhaps what happened in this paper is if they're just taking regular air samples from the rooms of these patients, some of the aerosol droplets there may have been recent and probably those droplets had better replication ability than the ones that were older. And unfortunately, none of these aerosols are time stamped. So they separated them by size, but we don't know, you know, some of those droplets that were less than one micrometer might have been, you know, four or five, around for four or five times longer than some of the other droplets that were the same size. Uh, so I think it's very possible that if we're talking about the time frame of going into a coffee shop and being exposed to aerosol droplets that have been in the room for three minutes, these might be very infectious. But if we're talking about going into a room where people had been three hours ago and maybe someone coughed and sneezed in that room, besides just the circulation of the air, the continued exposure to blue light from the lighting may have degraded that virus to the point that it's not very capable of replicating. So I would say that the pathetic and impotent effect of the virus from the aerosols in this study to produce rapid growth in human cells characteristic of a virus capable of actually infecting a human suggests that aerosols are not primarily what we should be worrying about as having the highest infectious capability. We should be worried about the large droplets. And that's consistent with what has been the presumption underlying most of the policy, which is that this is not an airborne disease. This is a droplet droplet spread disease. Um, but nevertheless, tomorrow we're going to look at some data on the safety of the indoor air. And one thing that we have to be aware of is that in the short time frame, even with someone wearing a mask where the large droplets are filtered, but some of the smaller aerosols are not, we should be aware that there may well be some replicating capability of the virus in the aerosols. And for all we know, if those aerosols were released in the last three minutes and inhaled by a live human, uh, that may well be infectious. So tomorrow we're going to look at the safety of indoor air. Okay, so if you would like to, dis to discuss this post, there are this podcast or video, there are three ways to do that. So the Master Pass Free Forum is a forum that is free and open to anyone who wants to participate. Anything related to health and nutrition, including all aspects of the coronavirus, including this episode, is welcome. I do my best to participate several times a week, though I expect this forum to eventually be very large and may at some point... Uh, I may have to wind down my participation to a weekly basis if it starts to take off, uh, if it starts to take on a life of its own. You can join the Master Pass free forum for free at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash discuss. The Coronavirus Forum. This is for anyone who purchases the Food and Supplement Guide for the Coronavirus, pre-orders my upcoming Vitamins and Minerals 101 book, which will be released after the COVID-19 crisis has clearly subsided, or joins the CMG Ma CMJ Master Pass. If you do join, use the coupon code COVID-19 for 10% off the membership price. This forum is dedicated specifically to the coronavirus. It has subsections based on topics such as nutrition, medicine, lifestyle, and mechanisms of disease, and has a section where the archive version of my newsletter, which is where these videos and podcasts are produced from, is directly linked and each newsletter can be discussed on an individual thread. I consistently participate in this forum three to five times a week. If you would like that, you can purchase a copy of the guide uh, of the coronavirus guide at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash coronavirus or pre-order the book at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book or join the CMJ Master Pass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash master pass. The third place to discuss this would be the Master Pass discussion group. Preserved for those who join the CMJ Master Pass, it's the best place to ask me questions in a fairly intimate environment and get a rapid response. 
All topics I cover are fair game and I consistently participate approximately five times a week. The MasterPass also has monthly live Zoom Q&As that are even more intimate. You can join the MasterPass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass. These research updates are made possible by purchases of the Food and Supplement Guide to the Coronavirus. The guide contains my most up-to-date conclusions about what we should be doing for nutritional and herbal support on top of hygiene and social distancing for added protection. Due to the absence of randomized controlled trials testing nutritional or herbal prevention, these are my best guesses for what is likely to work without significant risk of harm based on the existing science. By purchasing the guide, you enable me to continue devoting my skills to what appears to continue uh, to continue to be the most important issue we now face. I am genuinely grateful for your contribution. You can purchase a copy at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash coronavirus. You can get the guide for free if you pre-order my upcoming book, Vitamins and Minerals 101, How to Get the Nutrients You Need on Any Diet, to be released when the COVID-19 crisis subsides. You can pre-order it at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book. You can also get the guide for free when you join the CMJ Masterpass, which is meant to help people with significant health and wellness expen- expenditures consistently save money by returning marketing costs of the companies involved back to the members as rebates. A membership also saves you 30% on pre-orders of the paperback and 50% on pre-orders of the digital versions of my book. You can sign up at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass. This series is based on my free daily newsletter, COVID-19 Research Updates. As a result of the time it takes to produce a video or podcast from a newsletter that I wrote up, there's a slight delay between when I publish the newsletter and when you watch or listen to this. When you subscribe to the newsletter, you get the latest of my research every single day as soon as it's ready to come out. You get references and links to the sources for all the information, and you immediately get an archive of all the past issues. You can sign up at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash COVID-19 hyphen updates. Disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor. This is not medical advice. I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist, and I'm not speaking on behalf of infectious disease epidemiologists. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences, and my expertise is in conducting and interpreting research related to my field. Please consult your physician before you do anything for prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Please seek the help of a physician immediately if you believe you may have COVID-19. And that is all for today. Thanks again, and stay safe and healthy.